testing has started. I promised uh, my son that I would send him the recording of this so that my grandsons could watch the insect slides without interrupting while they were being presented. <laughs> Thank you. Move stuff out of the way. Oh, come on. They will be very fascinated by that. Jamie, it, are you still there, Jamie? It, it, Jamie, it would be cool if you put a link in the chat for where to find the recordings of the previous uh, meetings. Looks like we have some new faces tonight and some familiar faces. Let's just let's just wait a minute or two and see if we get a few more people logged on and then we'll get we'll get started. Are you able to hear me now? Yes. Oh, great. My name's Peggy. I live in Ypsilanti. And I was invited by Tajiji, I think her name is. By Tajali. Tajali. Thank you. I had trouble with it too at first, her name. Your name, your name says owner. If you go up, uh, Oh, this isn't. Mine Zoom. does? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, the person who just introduced yourself. Yeah. We, oh. see, we see your name as owner. Maybe you can change it. Okay, I'm not familiar with this program. Let's see. In the upper right, there's settings. Yeah, here it is. Choose virtual background speaker. If you just double click on your name, it should become an editable text box. Oh. I just did that for myself, so. Thanks, David. Oh my gosh, there's Ruth. Hello. So good to see you. And you're muted, Ruth. Okay. Let's go ahead and get started. And I'm sure we'll have some more people joining us as we go on here. Hi, welcome to the Sierra Club here on Valley Group's monthly program for January, coronavirus edition. Happy New Year. Uh, we are the Sierra Club group that represents Washtenaw, Monroe, and Lenaway counties. My name is Danny Ezekiel, and I'm the program chair for the Huron Valley Group. The Sierra Club is our nation's oldest and largest environmental group. Our motto is explore, enjoy, and protect the planet. If you aren't already a member, please join at sierraclub.org. Uh, it's $15 a year, I think, for the first year. And I want to thank Jamie McGeera for hosting and facilitating uh, our virtual meeting here on Blue Jeans. A few months ago during this meeting, we had a crash of blue jeans. I think that's pretty unlikely, but if it would happen, please just stay on the link. And in the chat, we'll tell you how to continue with the meeting. What happened last time was blue jeans crashed and within five minutes, it was back up again, but we had lost about half our people. Our, our presentation tonight is a real treat and I don't want anybody to miss it for any reason. Let's start as we have been starting with a moment of silence to honor those who've passed away from COVID, those who have been sick, those who have lost someone or had a family member sick, our essential workers and our first responders. Also those who are in need or hungry or homeless or afraid of losing their home. 
or have lost their job, those who fear violence in their communities, including those who fear police violence. Thank you. So a little bit of news. Uh, we held our executive committee election in December. And first off, we need to apologize to those who didn't get their newsletter in time to vote by mail. That includes me, by the way. We've had issues about this for several years now, and your leadership is determined to get to the bottom of it and do a better job this year. Fortunately, this time the elections were uncontested and we did get some votes. So. Uh, the results are official. As a result of the voting, we have two new executive committee members, uh, Jennifer Ankney and Taj Lee Hodge. Is either one of you here? Here, Dan, Taj Lee. You want to say hi? Hi, everyone. I'm Taj Lee. I'm over on the east side of Washtenaw County, and um, I'm in Ipsy Township. Um, and this is my first time serving on the board. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, I'm also an Ypsilanti Township Park Commissioner, recently elected, and looking forward to doing some good things out here with our green spaces. Nice to see everyone tonight. Yay. Um, when the new executive committee members, oh, I should say, Jason Frenzel and I were reelected to start new two-year terms. Uh, when the new executive committee members joined our leadership, we held an election for officers. And I'm pleased to tell you that we have a new chair and a new vice chair. Uh, Jason Frenzel will be chair and Ann Brown will be vice chair. Something really cool about this is that Jason is a former Ann Arbor City Council member and Ann is a former Ypsilanti City Council member. Uh, their current day jobs are Jason, volunteer coordinator for the Huron River Watershed Council, and Ann, staff member for U.S. Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin. So we have new leaders who are very savvy about environmental issues, locally, regionally, and nationally. Uh, and then with the addition of Ms. Ankney and Ms. Hodge, we now have three out of seven executive committee members from IPSI. Hopefully in future elections, we can gain even more diverse representation, including from Monroe and Lenawee counties. Um, are either Jason or Ann with us? Going once, going twice. I know Jason had out of town visitors and he said he wanted to come on next month and say a few words. We had a peaceful trans transition of power, everybody. We tried to, we tried to set a good example around here. Um, so we are working with three other Sierra Club groups to coordinate publicity for our online programs. Um, I saw Mike Buza is here. He's from the Nepeson group up in Flint. You wanna say hi, Mike? Hi, uh, Mike Buza from the Nepeson group. We rep and my wife is joining me tonight. Uh, we're, uh, that's Genesee, uh, that's uh, Genesee Lapeer, uh, North, or excuse me, Southern uh, Saginaw County and Northern Oakland County. I'm glad to be here. That's awesome. Mike's a big uh, a big campaigner for renewable energy. Um, we also have our neighbors directly to the north, the Crossroads Group um, in Livingston County, and they're sponsoring a fine program tomorrow night. Is there anyone here from Crossroads that wants to talk about that? I can, I've got the information here, but I wanna let them share if they choose to. Okay, I'll read you what I have, and I'll put the link in the, in the chat after I get done talking. Uh, the Crossroads Group tomorrow night has uh, the State of Social and, the State of Social and Environmental Justice in Southeast Michigan. It's at 7 p.m. tomorrow night. Uh, it's presented by the Reverend Julie Brock from Detroit. Uh, she's a lifelong white native of Detroit and a very dynamic speaker. And please come and spread the word. Uh, with a focus on the city of Detroit, Reverend Julie Brock will talk about what it means to have your identity or zip code 
determine whether you are treated equally under the law or have clean air to breathe. So again, I'll put a link to that in the chat uh, during the presentation. And then the other one we're cooperating with is Southeast Michigan. Is there anybody here tonight from the Southeast Michigan group? Going once, going twice. All right. So we like to share a win with you at every meeting. Uh, and the one I'm going to share is at this time tomorrow, we will have a new president and vice president who are environmentalists. The four year environmental nightmare of the Trump administration will finally be concluded. The Sierra Club nationally and locally worked hard to elect President Biden and Vice President Harris. Let's note that the new president has pledged to re-enter our nation into the Paris Climate Accord tomorrow and also to cancel the permit for the XL pipeline tomorrow as well. Uh, president Biden and Vice President Harris's prospects for enacting strong environmental legislation are hugely strengthened by the election of two Georgia environmentalist candidates to the United States Senate, giving us the possibility of an environmental majority there. So the Sierra Club and some of us locally worked on that Georgia special election too. Uh, these, are, these are long nights and we're in the midst of a terrible pandemic, but better times are ahead. I see lots of new faces and this is the time when we ask for you know people to say hi. Uh, is there anybody who'd like to tell us who they are and why they came tonight? Don't all jump up together. Oh, Sue, please. Hi, I'm Sue Shank. I'm now chair of the Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners. So we have an environmentalist as the chair of the Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners. The reason I'm here tonight, besides loving Sierra Club, is that I love insects and I'm so excited for this program. That's awesome. Thank you, Sue. She is such a champion of the environment and when we had a uh, Eastern equine encephalitis scare uh, last year. She was instrumental in getting the state not to do blanket insecticide spraying on wetlands all over our, all over our area. And she's taken a lot of leadership on a lot of environmental issues. Who else wants to say hi to us? Uh, hi, my name's uh, Aiden. I'm actually from Heartland, so I'm in the wrong group, I guess. I didn't know which one. Um, I'm a senior at, at Oakland University um, right now, studying environmental science. Um, so we learn a lot about this year at club. So really interested me to see this posted in one of my Facebook groups. I thought I might stop in. We're so happy to have you. What Facebook group was it? I don't remember. I'm a part of so many that I don't remember. It was one of the Michigan gardening or maybe a native plant one. I don't remember. Maybe the botanical, the U of M botanical gardens? It could have been, yeah. All right. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, this is Al Hodge. Uh, I live in Pittsfield, uh, right between Saline and Ann Arbor. And uh, I just thought it was an interesting program. Uh, certainly the health of our insect population is a good indication of how healthy our environment is. And uh, one of the Get a good handle on that and see what's new. All right. I'm Lisa Lava Keller, and I just wanted to say hi. Um, I remember Leroy, Dave's dad, who was a principal in Ann Arbor, and he was on city council. And um, I know about you, Dave, but I, I don't know you. Um, and I just, I saw that you were doing this program. I'm a, I, I taught uh, elementary science to a lot of kids and I I love insects too Sue so um, I had a lot in my classroom encouraged the kids to bring them in and I'm really looking forward to this program so. thanks Lisa it's good to see you yeah likewise Dan I'm Dan Friedis um, I live in Ann Arbor Township and like Lisa I think I actually knew Leroy Capert before I met Dave when we were in grad school together. Um, but so it's been, we've been friends for a while, but haven't seen you in a while. Nice to see you. All right. Uh, 
We're almost there. Just let me tell you about next month's program. Uh, next month's program will be about the Flint water crisis. And we are lucky enough that we're going to have Mike Steinberg, uh, University of Michigan law professor and formerly the head of the Michigan ACLU, as well as Melissa Mays, who is a Flint mom and water activist. Um, and the program will be at this same link and at the same time, Tuesday, uh, February 16th from 730 to 9 o'clock. All right. Without further ado, this month's program, uh, which has had various names, but one name is Windows on Biodiversity. We have entomologist and insect photographer extraordinaire David Capert with us from Oregon. David and I have been friends for a lot of years, and I've always admired his remarkable photography and his knowledge about and love of invertebrate life. I don't think my grandson Donovan will ever forget the time David grabbed a butterfly out of the air around our garden and gently held it to give my grandson a better view, then released it to fly away unharmed. I'll let him introduce himself. Take it away, David. Hello, if you got me, can you hear me? We can hear you, yeah. Okay, fine. Can you see my screen though? Yes, we can see your screen. Oh, fantastic. Okay, good. Then I am ready. Well, to we go. see the selector for the screen sharing. Oh, there we go. Now we see your presentation. You yeah. see a giant peak. Okay, cool. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, Dan knows that if I'm given a chance to proselytize about insects, I will do it for anyone, anytime. Um, and if anybody has some really curious picture on your phone and you want to figure out what it is and you can't, email it to me and I will help you figure it out. So yeah, I'm just really excited to talk to people. I'm a little uh, trepidatious sometimes about talking to grownups because a lot of my work has been with um, kids, especially K-8, and they are a very easy audience. Uh, I find that when I talk to <clears throat> Grown-ups, I usually hear something about the spiders in someone's basement and what can they do about it. Um, but I'm thinking the Sierra Club will be a, a little bit more receptive. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I'm going to, you know, talk mostly about um, insects. I've got a cameo from a, in, from a vertebrate or two. I live in Oregon, uh, born in Ann Arbor, but um, I live in Oregon right now. And uh, the picture you see here, this, this is what I am doing today. I'm looking at a bee like this one and trying to figure out what the heck it is. And it's one of the really exciting things about biology, entomology, but all branches, that the depth of what we don't know is astonishing. And so this, I can make a really fine photograph of this bee, and I know it's in the genus Coleoxys, and I, I can't figure out what species it is, and I don't know if anyone else will be able to. That's why I take a photo like this so I can share it with other people. And we may have to run DNA to figure it out. And I collect bees like this in prairies in the Pacific Northwest. And they're just utterly common, but there are dozens of species of this particular genus. And I spend my time trying to sort that out. So it's great work if you can get it. Um, so here's what I wanna do. The general idea here is um, I'll say a little bit about the tropics, which is sort of everybody's textbook case of um, oh wow kind of diversity. And then I have, um, it just happens I had some, some video from Furstenberg Park, so I'm going to share that. Um, and some of you are familiar with that park in Ann Arbor. Um, and then I'm going to, um, it, it, it's like I've dared myself to look at this one house on Olden Road where I stayed for a couple of days a few summers ago. And I went out to see every interesting thing I could find on that property. So I'll share those with you. Um, I'll talk a little bit about aphids as an example of one organism and the way it connects 
to many others in a way that you can see yourself anywhere, anytime. And then I've got another couple topics, and I'm going to try to keep track of my own time and see if I get to those. And this whole blue jeans thing is tough because normally I expect to be interrupted frequently by questions and discussion. It's a little harder here, so I'm going to probably just forge ahead and uh, answer questions at the end. So I'll try to stay, stay on time, and uh, I'm going to start, like I said, with the tropics. So I'm going to go to a piece of video. And it'll start like, let me go, slideshow, I'll get there in just a second. Um, I wanted to, you'd think I had this figured out. Uh, I might have to show it small. Uh, let me try this. No, that's, that's full. Okay, well, I'm going to. Uh, you're going to be able to like think a little bit about how um, somebody works in um, this software. So you see the whole process here, and the picture, the interesting picture, is in the middle of the screen. And I might be able to amplify that a little bit. I should be able to. There you go. Okay. So we're going to look at that. So this is a lot of audio here. Hopefully you can hear it. So what's going on here is, um, this is in French Guiana, I was there a few years ago, and uh, these are other entomologists that I was, I was hanging out with. And one thing that entomologists really like to do when they're studying, especially if they're studying moss, they put up these big sheets with really powerful mercury vapor lights that are super attractive to moss and lots of other kinds of bugs. And so <clears throat> this is what comes, the sheet looks like that. So now I'll go back to my PowerPoint and um, the kind of stuff you see you know, just a few small samples. Um, these are things you would see on a light sheet. Lots of moss. Um, they're, you know, gorgeous and mysterious. And if you don't know what they are, um, they're just aesthetically really beautiful. Um, if you do know what they are, there's a ton of biology behind the 400 species of moss you might see in a night on one sheet. For example, um, these moss are all Arcteids. It's a, it's a family, the tiger moss. And at this one location in French Guiana, where I was working, uh, the other folks I was with who'd been there for a number of years had collected 300 distinct species of Arcteidae, this one family, of which there's probably a half a dozen in Ann Arbor. So it's just the, the diversity is, is crazy. And part of why I'm showing you this, this tropical stuff is because I actually want to get right past it. Um, I have this problem when I, when I had students, um, a lot of times they were really excited about nature and they had watched tons of National Geographic shows. And they would talk all about sloths and monkeys and you know the tigers, et cetera, et cetera. And it was frustrating to me because there is nothing especially more interesting about the tropics than Furstenberg Park. And I will try to make that case for you. There are more species in the Amazon uh, than locally, and a lot of them are much bigger, but they're not intrinsically more interesting. And that, at least that's, that's how I experience it. Here's a couple of the really showy things that you get in the tropics. On the left, um, that's one of my students with a titan beetle. Uh, it's one of the largest, by weight, one of the largest insects in the world. Um, it's a wood borer. It's the kind that we call a, a longhorn borer. And an interesting thing about that titan beetle is that nobody knows anything at all about its life history. It was discovered in the 1950s in the stomach of a fish in an Amazonian river. And later they found the live specimens. And at the site where I was, they show up occasionally at light sheets. They, they blunder in. We don't even know if they fly. They come walking up and you just go out and pick them up. And so this is one of the biggest insects in the world and we don't know anything about its background or what its larvae feed on. And the other picture is a white witch moth, and this is something that I've done my own research on. 
for quite a long time. And the white witch moth, this is a small one, but the, the largest white witch moths are the largest insects in the world. They have a wingspan of about 12 inches. And this one too, we don't know what its caterpillars feed on or what they look like. It's a complete cipher, even though it's relatively common. It's been seen everywhere across the whole new world. And that's a talk I would, you know, happily give another time to any audience. It's, it's, it's a really exciting project. So that's the tropics. And so now I want to switch back to Furstenberg Park. And I'm going to have to figure out my, um, my final cut so it will show a slide. So hold on a second. Um, way back. Way screen. Here you go. Okay. So, and this is just a filler. These are, um, so the background of this is, I, many of you are, I'm sure, are familiar with, with Furstenberg Park. It's out by here on high school. Um, and it's, the, Ann Arbor is super lucky, number one, in having really beautiful green spaces uh, that are interspersed around the city. And number two, having this um, organization, the National Area Preservation, that puts enormous effort into trying to preserve native plant landscapes. Um, and Furstenberg is a really good example of where they've done this quite effectively. So a few years ago, I was there. This, I'm going to show you what I saw in one day in Furstenberg. And I always tell my kids, my students, um, they think when I show them slides that, oh, it's just like National Geographic. And I'm going to admit to you right up front that, no, I'm not a very good videographer. But the things that I can show you um, are pretty cool, uh, if you ask me. And I was an early adopter of drones, so there's a little drone footage here. One of the important qualities of a natural area is the grasses, the kinds of grasses, and if they're native or not, something people mostly don't pay attention to. Lots of different flowers in August in that field. There's a small wetland that's just crazy with living things. These are water striders. This is my gesture to vertebrates. If you sit in that one place for an hour or two, you'll see things like this. You won't just walk and by, but I, you know, I sat down here for an hour or two and I saw those guys. And then the frogs, you can never find them unless you sit there forever and wait. It's called an orange pennant, really common butterfly, or I mean, dragonfly, sorry. Um, Pro tip, if you see a dragonfly on a branch like that, it will come right back there when you scare it. This is sitting in one place and watching the grasshoppers from just one place on the ground. This is a firefly. milkweed leaf beetle. And this is one of the most beautiful bugs you have in Michigan. It's called a dog vein beetle. Some of you might recognize that one. That's a um, milkweed tussock moth, and know there was a larvae. If you're an entomologist, you look for frass, those little poops that uh, you saw. That's when I see those, I know to look for a, for a caterpillar. This is a hummingbird moth. If you have this flower, if you have monarda or bee balm, you will have these moths at some point during the summer. They're hard to photograph. They're really quick. These, these are, 
It's the same species in those. Those are bees that are a pretty uncommon sort of bumblebee. There's like four or five species you might see in Ann Arbor. This is called a bull and doily spider. They're tiny little guys, and if it's a misty, misty day, you will see them all over a field. Okay, so that's my little piece of video from Furstenberg, and and you know, like I'm saying, I you know, I'm not video is not my medium, but my point with that is. You can see all that stuff if you go there in August. You will see everything that I saw and then a whole bunch of stuff that was too little or too fast for me to photograph or things that I just didn't run across. And this is something I always like try to get kids to do and kids end up doing it better than I can possibly do to just go out and look. Um, and if you get yourself in a habit of doing that, you see things you, you just can't believe all the time. So, so Furstenberg, is special um, because because of the effort that NAP has put into it, uh, and it, it's just a really beautiful site. But I always really like to make the point that it's it this life is everywhere um, in roadside ditches and empty fields and you know um, dumps. I've I've seen really neat things in the least likely places. So here's where I went to my neighbor's house. So this I used to live at this house, 1112 Olden Street, and I was next door to John Vandermeer. John um, is a professor at University of Michigan. He does really interesting um, ecological work. And after I left town, I came back one summer and stayed at John's house uh, for a, a couple of days. And so during those couple of days, I, I figured I would just document what I could find at his house. So, so here you go, and th this is what it looks like from the front. Um, obviously, if he had a typical lawn, you wouldn't see any of the things I'm about to show you because he has just a bit of wild landscape and enough different kinds of flowers. There's an enormous number of things to see there. So dragonflies. Um, I mentioned before, it went a little bit too quick for me to talk about it, but uh, the, the bee on the right is a Eastern bumblebee, Bombus impatiens, and it's about 90% of the bees that you see. And the one on the left, if I remember right, it might be Bombus fervidus. And when I see something that doesn't have yellow up front and then the first segment of the abdominal um, segments is yellow and then the rest of it's black, when I see something that's as yellow as this one, it's, it's a different species and it's an interesting species. On the left is a picture of um, a leaf that's been that's been chewed on by a leaf cutter bee. And what they make these perfectly circular little holes. And so when you see these, a caterpillar would not feed in this way, or a beetle. This is done by a leaf cutter. So when you see this, you can expect to see the bee that's on the right. And leaf, leaf cutters, I mean, they're quite beautiful and they have their pollen carrying um, hairs are underneath their abdomen. A few, um, it, it, this is, a picture of two bees and one wasp. Um, and if this was a different group, if we were live, I would try to get people to, you know, offer their hypotheses about which is which. Uh, but instead, I will just tell you on the left here, this is a sweat bee, uh, Holictus. And the one in the upper right here is what's called a small carpenter bee or serotina. And these are really small, they're like five millimeters. Um, and it's the kind of thing that you wouldn't notice if you didn't have a, you know, big, powerful macro lens. And if you weren't an entomologist that really cares about bees the way that I do. Uh, but these are, these are really handsome. They're, they're shiny like a ball bearing. And they're super common. And then the one in the lower right here, this is called a bee wolf. It's a wasp. And these are parasites of, uh, of all kinds of bees. So they will attack a bee and deposit their larvae into another um, bigger, scarier bee. 
These are two of the commonest wasps that you'll see around um, gardens in Ann Arbor. On the left is a, um, a golden digger wasp, and on the right is a, it's called a great black wasp. And they're both pretty big and pretty scary and would never sting you. This is another bee parasite, and it's, it's common on flowers. Um, a lot of people have never seen it or realized that they've seen it, but if you look for it, I mean, you can always find them. And so it's called a wedge-shaped beetle for kind of obvious reasons. And that's a male. The males have these crazy antennae like these. This was a cool thing to notice. So this, this is... Um, all one organism. On the lower left, this is the the uh, adult form, and it's called a. I should have done this before. It's called a uh, tortoise beetle, and tortoise beetles are are really cool. And some of them have this this beautiful golden iridescence. Um, I, but since I didn't see one in John's yard that day, I'm not using one of those photos. I'm showing you the relatively pedestrian one that I saw there. But the larvae are crazy. So. So this picture here is the, of the larva, and it has these big sort of horns that it holds over its back. And then it onto those horns, it packs its own feces. So here, when you see it from the side, there's this big mound of feces on the top of it, and it's sort of plastered. I assume the way that its legs can access it back means it makes this sort of bizarre pattern to this, uh, this pile of, of insect poop. Um, which, by the way, is called frass. We don't call it poop in the entomology world. <laughs> and uh, it's, and it, that, of course, it's a defensive um, strategy, and may, maybe camouflage as well. But the, and this is a good example of something. That, I mean, I spend more time than anybody that you know walking around in fields looking for bugs, and I had never seen this before. And here's another thing that you see um, all the time when you take photographs of insects. I just now saw this for the first time. This is the akeen of some kind of a composite flower. And yeah, until you stare at these images for a while, sometimes things just don't pop out. This is one of my favorite bugs. Um, and it's I put it here because like the tortoise beetle, it's uh, it camouflages itself. And it does it by cutting little pieces of flower or seeds, or in, in this case, they're flower parts. And it cements those to its body. So this is a caterpillar. This is the head right here. These are the anal prolegs, and it's a it's a typical emerald type of um, caterpillar. So they they're loopers, and they're, I don't see them like frequently, but every year I'll see one or two someplace. And if you start looking for them, you see them a lot more. Um, they're pretty hard to notice, and so this one is actually quite small, so it's not going to jump out at you. But if you look for these, you can find them. Utterly mundane, common uh, daddy long legs, but they're pretty weird animals. You know, it's the kind of thing you get when you take photographs and stare at them. It's like, how does this thing even support itself? You ask questions like that. Uh, a couple of crab spiders, and this is another thing that if you look at flowers, particularly at disc flowers like sunflowers and. Uh, sunflower types, you know, asters and so on. Uh, you frequently find these. In fact, this summer when I was working in Oregon, out of every 50 or 100 disc flowers that I looked at, there would be a crab spider. So it wouldn't take very long to find a bunch of different ones. And these are of a genus that's called Misumena. Then you find um, other kinds of spiders. So the one on the left is the commonest jumping spider you can find in Ann Arbor. It's called Phidippus audax. And People have problems with spiders, and, and I don't get it. This this is like a really beautiful animal. And the one on the right is a wolf spider, a long-legged wolf spider. And th this one, I was surprised to see it in a yard in, in the city. Usually I see these in forests, but I, I see them in Pinckney. I see them in Bird Hills um, all the time in the late summer. And this one's called the spined microthena. And if you haven't figured it out, um, of course, these are its legs and its, its cholesterol, its fangs are here, so this is sort of the head portion. And then the entire abdomen is this huge, sort of encrusted, uh, heavily chitinized, spiny, shell-like thing. These are the spinnerets. This is where the 
um, silk would come out. And they're just really cool to see. It's pretty small, but you would definitely see it. And they make webs that cover pretty large spaces. So when you walk through the woods and you sort of walk through a web, it could be one of these. So the one on the right is a, um, a bombelid, uh, a bee fly. And this one I might see once in a while. The one on the left, I can't remember what the heck it is. And it's, it's the perfect example for me of, I mentioned up front, I see things that I never saw before. This is in a house next door to where I lived for five years. And I had never seen this fly and not, not before and not since. And it just, that just happens all the time. The one on the left is a, um, it's a little tiny hoverfly. Uh, it's called Toxamaris geminatus. Um, and the one on the right is another kind of hoverfly. And I don't know what species it is. It's quite unusual because of the dark um, and relatively hairy segments there. So th these are the ones, they're bee mimics. A lot of times people mistake hoverflies for, for bees. Um, there's a surefire way to know this could not possibly be a bee. I mean, there's a lot of clues, but if you don't already know this, flies are different from every other kind of flying insect in that they have one pair of wings, not two pairs. And instead of the hind pair, they have this little uh, knob on a stick, which is called a halter. And it's used to, um, to balance the insect in flight. And I just saw a recent paper that said that, that flies that leap away before your hand gets anywhere near squashing them flat, they need these halters to be able to coordinate their flight when they take off. This, I have no idea what it is. It's really cool. Uh, a bunch of ants. I'm going to talk a little bit more in a short bit about um, this one. The one on the right is called Crematogaster, uh, acrobat ant. The other one's a formica, just a typical, it's one of the most common ants you'd find in yards in Ann Arbor. Milkweed leaf beetle. Uh, these things are called, um, they're different life stages of the wide-footed tree hopper. So it's an obvious uh, spine mimic as an adult. Uh, again, we got one of these hummingbird moths like you saw at First in Bird Park. A black swallowtail on the left that's on um, milkweeds. And then I put a vertebrate in here just to be fair to my friends who are fond of vertebrates. Uh, and then at night at John's house, um, oops, sorry, be right back. Where's my, at night um, on the orange paint of his house, you know, under his porch light, I saw these things and lots more actually. I mean, I just picked some kind of cool ones that, that I happened to run across. So, so that's all kind of cool for me to, to find all those things in one place at one time. And I've done that. I have similar slideshows I could give you of 2061 Day Street in Ann Arbor and of a house I know in Wagner. And if I came to your house, unless you have a plain dull lawn, I could probably do the same thing or you could do the same thing. Um, so another way I want to get at biodiversity is rather than just look at everything you can see in one place, um, start with one organism and see what we can see that's connected to that organism. So. My model for this is the aphid. Um, so you've all seen aphids. Uh, the one on the left is a green peach aphid, and the, the yellow ones are, uh, they feed on milkweed, but they're called oleander aphids. And if you don't know, I'm, here's how aphids work. Um, they're like plant mosquitoes. So they insert their, their mouth parts um, through the surface layers of, of uh, leaf and into the phloem tissues where the sap flows. And the sap then, it's under pressure, just like your blood is under pressure um, when a mosquito bites you. And so the sap flows into the insect under pressure and it extracts the nutrients that it needs as, as that n nectar flows or that sap flows through, the, through it. And then out the other end comes a little bubble of what they call honeydew. So it's this sugary, uh, what, what remains after this insect has taken its nutrients out. There's just this surplus of carbohydrate that it comes out the back end of it. And that's really important because lots of things feed on that, uh, most especially ants. Pro tip here is um, 
if you think it might be an aphid, you probably know it when you see one, but the definitive feature is this uh, exhaust pipe. They're called cornicles, and this one has little tiny ones, but aphids always have those. The most essential thing about aphids is that they are phenomenal replicators. Um, number one, because they don't bother with an egg stage. They just give live birth like this one. It just, it just out comes a whole new aphid, and that whole new aphid has within her the capability of making another aphid. Um, so they're born pregnant, so to speak. And they're asexual. Um, there's different life stages that might have a sexual phase, but um, generally aphids are, they clone. So this one aphid would be a founding member. She would land on here, start feeding, immediately start cranking out these babies that are um, genetic clones of her. And they do this in a week or so. So the thing with exponential growth that we're also familiar with right now is that you start out with one aphid and a week later, you know, it's doubled and then five days later, it's doubled again. And it doesn't take very long before that colony gets like crazy dense. And so they often, they start out just being occasional and sometimes plants are just laden with aphids. So there's, um, <clears throat> let me see here. No, okay. So I want to look at two ways that aphids are connected to other organisms. One is as a food source um, in the form of honeydew, and the other is as a food source in the form of being eaten by somebody else. So here's what you can do um, anytime the weather gets better. Find a plant with aphids on it. And if you look at milkweeds in the late summer, they almost always have aphids. And if you look at rose bushes, unfortunately, they frequently have aphids. And cabbage plants, by the time fall comes around, almost every cabbage is covered with cabbage aphids. Um, you've probably seen them. So you can go out and find one of these things. And anytime you do find an aphid colony on a plant, you will also find ants. So these are a few of the typical species you might see here. Um, the ones on the left are the ones I showed you at John's house, the, the acrobat ants. And so these, these guys are coming around and they're going to the butt end of an aphid and they're sipping that honeydew that went through that insect. Um, and that's where lots of ants get all of their carbohydrates covered. And, and many different species do this. So that's an acrobat ant, that's a carpenter ant on the right. Uh, that on the left is one of the commonest ants you would find uh, in disturbed areas, it's called a pavement ant. And they do literally occur around pavement very frequently. Uh, and on the right is a wood ant, um, one of the more common ones that you would see in a lawn in Ann Arbor. So you find an aphid colony, um, let's say in this case on a milkweed, so these are the, the oleander aphids, and you know it's going to develop into a really big infestation. So you mark it and you come back 10 days later and you will find that these nice big plump aphids, some of them have turned these weird colors like that. So they look to me like basketballs. So they're kind of dry, they're tan, sometimes they're black. And so what are those things? Um, here's what they are. So this is a wasp, like a super tiny wasp, you know, the size of, well, it's three millimeters long. And this is the head and she has, bent her abdomen underneath her body and she's pointing it forward and inserting her ovipositor, her stinger, into this aphid. She deposits an egg. That egg develops into a wasp larva that then grows and eats out the entire inside of this. And as that happens, the skin of the aphid gets tough and distended and you end up with what they call a mummy. So anytime you see a big aphid colony, you will eventually see aphid mummies. Um, these guys always show up. And this is actually, there's more to this story here. So inserted an egg, baby wasp grew, here's a mummy, here's a wasp that came out of that mummified aphid. Um, although in this case, this wasp is actually a hyperparasitoid. So it parasitized the parasite, but that's too, complicated to get further into right now. Um, you also have predators, of course, and most people know about lady beetles being um, effective predators of 
of aphids. Unfortunately, most of the lady beetles you see nowadays are the Asian um, imported exotic lady beetle. The one on the left is a, a now less common convergent lady beetle. Another thing you will often find around aphid colonies is lacelings. So you're most likely to see the eggs. They're these weird, um, I mean, there's no other insect that does this that I'm aware of where the egg is on a stalk that's elevated above the leaf, presumably to avoid predation. And that would have been laid by an adult lacewing that looks like that. And this is what the larvae look like. And the larvae are aphid specialists and they're awesome predators. They're used sometimes in biological control. You can actually buy them. Um, they work much better than lady beetles. Uh, don't buy lady beetles for biocontrol, they don't work. And they're so voracious, they happily eat each other. So this, this one is a lacewing that's eating another lacewing. You also, I mentioned hoverflies before. So hoverflies are, they're, they feed on nectar and pollen as adults. But as larvae, I mean, there's a million kinds, but many of the larvae are predaceous on aphids. And when you see them in an aphid colony, they look like some kind of caterpillar. Like, what the hell is that? The first time I saw this, I, I couldn't place it at all. But they're relatively common, and that's something that hoverflies do. And um, just to complete the story, there's a lot more we could say about aphids. Um, my take home is, if you see an aphid colony, watch it, because you will be able to see some of these relationships and more. Um, so it's like the easiest science experiment that you can do. Um, there's other insects that feed just the same way that aphids do, and those include mealybugs and whiteflies. They have sucking mouth parts. They produce honeydew. They're also big pests. And it turns out that the honeydew that's produced by insects like these is possibly as important as a sugar resource for insects as flowers are. And sort of like a, a very surprising thing, but there's some research that suggests, yes, up in the treetops, there are leaf hoppers and aphids feeding on the leaves, and insects are grazing on that honeydew and getting a lot of mileage out of it. Uh, another set of insects that are also feeders like this and produce honeydew include the, um, the tree hoppers that I have already shown you before and this very photogenic uh, leaf hopper. Okay, so now I'm going to do a quick promo. Dan, tell me how I'm doing on time. Do I have anyone there? You're good. I was yeah. Muted. Okay, Go, fine. Keep going. Go yeah. For okay. It. So I'm going to I'm going to interrupt myself to do a short um, public service announcement for iNaturalist, and some of you may know about this, but. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a real entomologist and I've been doing this stuff forever and ever. And I'm pretty good at insects. I know them, I know them pretty well. Um, I'm clueless about mushrooms. Um, Dan would know that I'm clueless about birds beyond ducks and eagles and such. Um, so I have a problem if I'm looking for anything that I don't already know about, figuring out what the hell it is that I, that, that I just saw. And, and a lot of times, if you can't give a name to something, it's hard to sort of place it in your mind or give it the importance that it merits. And so you want to find out what it is, which is why people carry field guides all over the place. Um, iNaturalist is better than a field guide, or it's, a, it's, a, it's another tool um, that adds a lot of capability. So it's a citizen science project. It works like eBird, which I, a lot of people I think are familiar with. And some of you might already know about um, iNaturalist, but the, the scheme is, like with other projects, you take a picture of some thing, you upload it to a, to a site, and there is some awesome pattern matching software on that site that takes that wiggly, green, antennaed, caterpillary thing and looks at tens of millions of other images already in the database and it makes a match and it tells you, I think that this is a milkweed tussock moth. So it gives you an idea. I'll show you how it works in just a second. So you can get an ID from a photo pretty accurately most of the time. And there's a lot of tools for sharing what you discover with other naturalists and also seeing where was this bug seen by other people and what time of year, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the single most powerful thing I can promote for people if I want them to get jazzed about bugs and other things. 
So here, here's the kind of map um, of all the observations on iNaturalist, of which there are 62 million observations at the moment, and 316,000 species are in this database. And if I click on any one of these little orange things, I know that on August 31 in 2017, a whooper swan was seen in Iceland. And I could say exactly where it was. And if I wanted to know about it, I could go to that user and email them and say, tell me more about that whooper you saw. Right, so it's it's really powerful in that way. Um, and the, the quick way it works is you start with some photos. And I, I picked some pretty good photos and you can use some pretty bad photos and still get really um, surprisingly accurate results. But you take a photo and you upload it. I do it from my computer, but you can do it from a phone. And the interface looks like this. So here's the photo that I uploaded. And iNaturalist immediately comes back. I say, where and when? And it comes back, we think this is a meadowhawk. And, and we think it might be a white-faced meadowhawk. So I've got these several options that I can consider. And sometimes it blows it, right? But probably I'm going to say, mm, I wonder if it's a white-faced meadowhawk because it looks like a pretty good match. I could click here and I could see hundreds of other images of white-faced meadowhawks so I can have more to compare to. So... I upload it like that. I say, okay, I'm going to call it a white-faced meadowhawk. I'm not sure, but that's what I'm going to name it. And then the next day, somebody else will come along, and they will, um, they will look at your ID. So here's a different one I did. So I suggested for this one, sorry, it's a different dragonfly. Um, I said, I think this is a king skimmer. And then someone named Joshua Lincoln came along and said, no, I think it's actually a spangled skimmer. And then this guy, Vic Fazio, came along later and said, it's, yep, I agree. So now we have two people who've made an ID. Who are these people and what right do they have to tell me, an entomologist, what kind of dragonfly that was? Well, you can go to their site, to their, their ID page. And so this guy who, who named it, you know, he was, did the Ohio Dragonfly Survey and he teaches entomology. He knows what he's talking about. And... It, it's very common on a naturalist that really skillful people give you feedback on what you saw in the photo that you post. Um, it's uh, like right now, I mean, bees is what I do. And, and I, my bee photos are typically identified within two days by John Asher, who is the world authority on, on the taxonomy of the kinds of bees I study. I mean, it's, it's, it's really powerful in that way. And once you have these things in there, then um, just like any birder would have a, a life list, a year list, and so on, I mean, those things are in that website. And, you know, here's a bunch of places that I have been and, and recorded things. And I've organized, um, the website can give me a taxonomic structured view of the things I've seen. So where have I seen Apagostamen Texanus, and so on. Uh, I love so. that there's one called a confusing furrow bee. Yeah, they're confusing for OB. If you want me, I could like bellyache about that for quite a while. It's definitely confusing because it's all about whether the subantennal suture is nine tenths as opposed to six tenths as long as some other part of the bee's face. And the darn thing is only like five millimeters long to begin with. So yes, it's confusing, very much so. <laughs> so anyway, that's that's my promo for INAT. Um, so here's one of the very quick story. I put this on Facebook so Dan has seen this. So this is one of the most beautiful insects that is everywhere in your world and you've never really paid it any attention, is my guess, because it's very small. Um, and and it's, it's called a long-legged fly. Uh, I like its scientific name, Dolicopodidae. And they have this iridescent green. There's a few that are blue, but most, most all of them look like this. They're in the genus Condostylus. And, and if you start just paying attention to the leaves around the garden, just like any place that you go, you will see these. They're super common. And I photographed quite a few of them. And last summer, I was, I was photographing um, one of these things. And right here at the beginning of this arrow, that's where this fly was. And I was using a flash and I clicked the shutter and I got this picture with the bee displaced way off to the left. 
said, well, that, what a coincidence, you know, I thought, it, just before I took the picture, it took off. But it wasn't like that. So here's a bunch of other pictures I got. When I kept coming back to that same fly and it would return to the same leaf and sit there until I tried to photograph it. In every photo I made, I got these streaky, blurry pictures. And what was happening is that in the time it took for the flash to emerge from my flash gun, be perceived by the insect, and then for the camera's shutter to go click in one one thousandth of a second, the insect had moved a long ways and, and I couldn't photograph it. I mean, it, it saw the darn light and moved before the camera could see the light, which astonished me. Um, and so eventually I came back and this is that same darn fly, this time taken with available light. So I didn't use a flash and it worked out. And of course, if you know anything about photography, I mean, the disadvantage is its eyes are in focus, but the rest is out of focus because I had to use a long, um, a wide aperture and a, and a long shutter speed. But the, for, the point of this for me is that things that are totally common and especially totally common to me because I see these everywhere all the time that I go. All right, so I've just got one more small chapter and then I, I'll, I'll leave you. So um, I'm gonna show you a few tiny things and, and I look at tiny things because I'm an entomologist and insects are, are tiny um, and also because I have a, a, a really nice macro lens that does 5x magnification. So I can see things that are two or three millimeters long uh, pretty well. And recently what I've been looking at is inside of mushrooms because a lot of things feed inside of mushrooms and they're all small. So here's a typical mushroom. Um, and again, it's, it's what you do if you live in Oregon in the fall. That's what you look at as mushrooms. Um, and so there's this weird little orange guy with antennae. And it turns out they're really pretty cute. And they have a really cute name. They're called plump springtails. And you only find them in mushrooms. And until I started looking inside mushrooms in the Pacific Northwest, I had never seen one. So you see those guys. Um, here's a couple other kinds of springtails. Two millimeters long, super small. The purple antennae of this one are crazy. It just, and it's, it's got this iridescence. I mean, it's a really beautiful insect that would look to you like a, like a grain of rice and you wouldn't be able to see any detail because it's so darn small. But if you can get close, they're really cool. And this is another one. Um, I'm not sure if these are parasitic on or phoretic on uh, roly-poly bugs, but it happened to be on the back of a roly-poly bug. So it gives you a sense of the scale. These ones, I think a lot of people know, um, and they present themselves to me frequently. Um, not now, but I did live in Connecticut until, until recently. So uh, that was ground zero for Lyme disease and for Lyme ticks. So I saw these guys a lot. And their biology is amazing. Um, they're, they're really cool. There's many stories to tell about ticks. Uh, a couple other like really tiny things. Uh, the one on the left is a is a stink bug. Um, stink bugs like aphids. They have these sucking mouth parts, sort of a long proboscis that they stick into things. Uh, the one on the right is called I think it's an elm leaf skeletonizing beetle. This mite. How does it get around with legs like that? It, it, and it, it this was underneath a log. So somehow this tiny thing navigates its way through the spaces under logs with such an ungainly set of legs. Then the other thing you get when you have your really tiny lens is, or your, your super macro lens is you run across things that are too big and you can't shoot them. So you just shoot parts of them and that can be really cool too. So it, I wonder if anybody knows what this is. Dan Friedis, do you know what this is? I don't know what it is. Okay, yeah, I thought Dan Friedis might. Um, this is this is a crane fly. Super common. They look like giant mosquitoes, and they're really easy to catch because they're slow and clumsy. Mm -hmm. And then on the left, of course, is a bumblebee, and on the right is a European paper wasp. 
Um, they have yellow antennae, so that's how you know they're, they're Europeans. Um, and that's it. That's, that's my show to date. So I'd be delighted to take any sort of questions or comments or whatever. Wow. Yay. I don't appreciate having the audience. I've got a question for you on the ticks. Yeah, sure. Um, you now, in growing up, we were always outside in the farm fields and uh, the woods and everything else. And I don't ever remember calling egg having a tick or even knowing anybody that got a tick. Yet now it seems to be somewhat commonplace. Are ticks yeah. expanding, or are they were they always there? We just didn't pay attention to them. Well, I mean that's a that's a good question, and and I agree with you that growing up in in Michigan. I, I can't say I was familiar with ticks at all um, as a problem, like running around in, in fields and so on. And you'll know more about what that's like now. I can tell you in Connecticut, yeah, ticks are ubiquitous. And on any serious hike that I would do, and I'm anomalous because I'm a, a lot of times scrabbling around in the weeds, you know, so I'm really vulnerable. Um, I would get ticks every day, you know, multiple and multiple species of ticks. So whether they're generally more Common, I do not. I do not know. Just don't. I'm going to say they're certainly expanding here in Michigan, and maybe because we're not having as cold winters. There's a place where I go camping in the spring. We never used to have any ticks, and now you almost you almost can't camp there in the spring anymore, up by the Pigeon River. Well, you know the Pigeon River, David. It's just yeah, absolutely overrun, overrun with ticks now in the spring. Yeah. Yeah. Huh, that's that's interesting. And some of them are like super important for um, ungulates for moose. Right now, there's there's a, a, a you know a, what do they call it? There's zombie moose wandering around in in Maine because the tick problem is so severe. They they have like sixty thousand ticks on a moose. It's not good. But yeah, I don't, it, it, luckily ticks are not in my um, purview because they're not insects. <laughs> David, on the other hand, we hear about um, more kinds of insect populations crashing. You want to shed any light on that? Yeah, I, I would really like to talk about that. Um, it's gotten enormous attention in the last year or so. And, and that came about mainly in the, in the academic world because there was a study done in, um, in Europe of malaise traps. Malaise traps catch flying insects that just indiscriminately they catch everything that's flying through a forest. You get put in a little jar and you can look at it. And it happened that Germans had been doing this malaise trapping um, at a whole series of natural areas throughout um, Western Europe for decades. So they had this fantastic record. And they concluded in looking at all their samples and they looked at every taxon. So they looked at, you know, beetles and moss and wasps and so on. Um, for all taxa, the numbers were crashing and the biomass was crashing. So it, there's two things that are going on with the insect decline. One is diversity. And that's sort of better understood by people that we have fewer kinds of butterflies than we used to have. And yeah, you know, there's like a lot of urban development. Agriculture has its impact. Etc. So it's not surprising that some relatively rare things vanish. You know, it's bad news. We should be able to control for it. But that's a problem in and of itself. The German study suggested that no, it's the biomass decreased by 80 some percent over the period of 30 years doing this malaise trapping. And some other studies have supported that. And that's, that's, Another whole problem that, that people are trying to get their, their heads around right now is it, the environment. I mean, it, it's like I said, it's very understandable that diversity would, would, would decline. We all know what drives that. But what would cause insects in general to become far less important in biology? We don't know for sure what, that, what might cause that. And also, it's very alarming if you're a birder. And you know that caterpillars have declined by 80%. Um, yeah, there's just no scenario in which birds don't get crushed. And it ramifies through ecosystems 
every place. So this would be a giant lecture because there's, there's a lot of back and forth about this. And some of us feel like the, the data is not, it, it's not uniform. And the German study is, is illuminating, but is it a global phenomenon? There's arguments yes and no on that, but um, it's, it's, it deserves the attention it's getting and it needs more. And one of the big problems for scientists is that we don't have the data because people have not been systematically sampling same location, same technique for 40 years, which is what we need really bad. So they're going to museums and looking at, at collections and that's illuminating to some extent, but you don't get biomass. You, there's a lot that you don't get that way. So yeah, I, I could ramble on about that for a long time. It's, re it's important, really important. And no one's gonna ask me about murder hornets. Please don't ask about murder hornets. <laughs> No, actually, you can if you wish. <laughs> uh, David, this is Lisa. Um, hello, this is my first time in the group, but I missed the interest. Uh, in your case, um, I do a lot of, um, you know, encouraging people to plant butterfly gardens, and that's kind of like the gateway drug, so they're just, you know, planting more native and diverse plants. But anyways, um, people often have a tr uh, problem with the aphids on their milkweed. Yeah. And so in order to get them to not do those uh, tra crazy traditional things where it's like, oh, I got to put soap on it. So then um, someone had said that if you just wash them off or wipe them off, that their mouth parts break off and they can't just, you know, get back on the plant. Of course, there's always some hiding somewhere, so I'm sure there are populations. But I was wondering if that was true, you know. I don't want well, to lie to people, but I don't want them to use soap either. Yeah, I think I think that's true. And they're extremely soft bodies, so you could just smear them on the plant and they would be very dead. But what I would do, and you know, so I worked at a school for a long time and we had milkweeds all over the place. And I don't think I've ever seen a milkweed plant that died from an aphid infestation. And one reason they don't die from an aphid infestation is because 100% of the time, they will be eliminated by natural enemies. The plant may sustain damage, but if I, if I had a school and I had a plant laden with, with aphids, a milkweed plant, I would say, don't touch those aphids. We're going to come back every three days and we're going to look for lacewing eggs. We're going to look for ladybugs. We will see ladybugs for sure. And those mummies that I talked about, the aphid parasites, you will see those 100% of the time. And a lot of times that, that aphid infestation, I mean, I had this problem at the school where I was, I, I had milkweeds that I kept indoors and I, want, I liked having the, the parasites to show people. But by November, my aphid colonies were just extinct. I, you know, I, I couldn't sustain them because the parasites would just eradicate them. Well, these, you know, I encourage people to leave them or plant enough milkweed that, you know, you could afford to lose some, like be a part of the system. Um, on this young, tiny seedlings, sometimes if people are trying to get started, then, you know, they can sell those. But um, yeah. the other thing that I heard, and I don't know if you know this because it's kind of a broader question, maybe somebody else might know, is that I saw somewhere, read somewhere, had some rumor that hummingbirds eat aphids, and I don't know if that's true. I've never seen them, hummingbirds, go after my aphids, so. Well, hummingbirds certainly are, they eat insects, right? And it's confirmed, Dan, don't they eat insects? Like, I don't know the answer. I thought they just ate sugar wine. Well, that's not gonna, that, they need more nutrition than that. I mean, I, I, I'm sure that they, they eat insects and I don't see Yes, they do. Yeah. Yes, they do. Thank you, right. Um, I know they eat insects for sure. I'm just wondering if they eat aphids. If yeah, it wouldn't surprise me diet. if they did, but it would very much surprise me if they ate the milkweed aphids because the milkweed aphids are highly toxic in, for the same reason that monarch butterfly caterpillars are toxic, right? From the cardiac glycosides, the, the, the chemistry of the milkweed is, is bad news. And that's why, and this is the kind of thing I tell kids all the time, it's like if, if there's an insect that is bright yellow, you can be sure that it's either hard to eat or dangerous. Because that, right, that's aposmatic coloration, that's warning coloration. That says to a predator, 
don't mess with me. I, you know, you're going to spit me right out because, you know, I'm nasty. So, so anyway, yeah, the, the thing about milkweed, I mean, it, of course, I, if you want to grow a little tiny milkweed and aphids are, are chowing down on it, you should, you should kill the aphids for sure. Like, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, but don't lose that learning opportunity for the observing the natural enemies. Um, and, and the other thing that when people talk about milkweed, um, milkweed populations in Ann Arbor are in no remote way limiting to monarch butterflies. It's the milkweed in Kansas that is of great concern. It's everything on the flyway coming north where it's all corn soy and there's just no, there's no milkweeds. Uh, but around Ann Arbor, it's, you know, ubiquitous. I mean, so, I mean, and, and it, of course you want to tell people plant milkweeds, put them in your garden. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a good story to tell and it's, it's, it's certainly a nice thing to do, but it's, it's not critical to monarchs, I don't think. Sue, so just jump in. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, it, thank you. Um, I have a question. If you can remember the light green butterfly that you found at your friend John's house, uh, I photographed one on my house last summer, and I couldn't find out the name of it anywhere. Now I know about iNaturalist. So, was it a butterfly or a moth? It was a. Oh, I, it was a moth. I think. Sorry if I misspoke. Um, it, it's very light green. Yeah. And I think it, we found it on his house. Yes, I think that one, I know which one you're talking about. I'm pretty sure it was a geometer uh, uh, known to ordinary people as an inchworm, like that group of moss, oh. um, of which there's many, many species. But this iNaturalist thing, I, if I anybody anywhere says they want me to give a presentation about iNaturalist to anybody, I will do it. So any of you that are in any sort of organization that for whom this might be a useful tool and you want me to help you promote it, email me and, and I'll be glad to do it because it's just really powerful. And, and I work with a lot of, I have worked with, with, with kids, you know, like, and if you, if you're a 12 year old and you're really geeky about insects, you're not going to have very many friends that relate to that. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge hit on you socially. So if you've got a platform where you can post pictures of things that you saw and have legitimate expert grown-ups tell you what those are and share information about them and have a life list it's game changing it's huge so i really really promote it i'm that 12 year old but i'm 54 53 yeah. sir yeah well and i'm 65 and same thing yeah yeah thanks yeah sure david anything else what? Yeah, what are you what are you normally shooting with on your macros? You mean like the the camera gear stuff? Camera equipment flash. Um, I use a, a, a Canon camera and and almost always a 180 millimeter lens. Um, except for the little stuff, I use a 65 millimeter one to five. If it's a really really close macro, and I use typically use a, a ring light right. for illumination. Are you using a full frame or a crop sensor? No, no crop sensor. Yeah, yeah, which is more than enough for what I do. Well, and you get better depth of field with the yeah. smaller sensor. True enough. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Well, anything else for the good of the cause? Here's your chance. Let's uh, get. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I've got these spiders in my basement, and I don't know what to do. <laughs> I suggest that you you eat some of them because spiders frequently have a sort of nutty flavor that can be quite satisfying. When I first met David, he had a pet tarantula named Fluffy. Um, <laughs> all right, let's uh, let's please give our presenters some uh, appreciation. That was amazing. Thank you. Yay! Um, let's all get some sleep so we can get up bright and early and start watching the inauguration festivities. Um, stay safe, everybody, and uh, think about think about going uh, to Crossroads presentation tomorrow night and come back next month for Flint Water. Thanks for coming tonight. Thank Bye, you. Everybody.
Stay safe. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks. How do I sign Thank you. I know for this. I guess I'll just do this. Ruth, it was so good to see your face.